So today, Greg Lucus and I are going to talk about the artist Jeff Koons as, as part of our perspective series. Jeff Koons is a very controversial artist. Um, he's been around for decades. Um, uh, he is one of the larger blue chip artists that we're talking about um, in this series. And so let's just jump in. This one's titled Inflatable Flower and Bunny, Tall White Pink Bunny. It's made of vinyl. And it looks like it's sitting on some mirrors. And it's uh, 32 by 25 by 19 inches. Yeah, these are, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with my view of Coons. I have specifically avoided a lot of his work because, uh, well, a lot of the stuff that is shown in museums, I don't know if it's um, his best quality work. You know, like you'll find a place, almost every major museum has to have one piece by Coons at least. Usually they're going to be some of his metal inflatable animals. Uh, this is interesting. I've never seen this early of work, 1979, with um, actual inflatables. Uh, so he started making these out of metal later on. But my frustration with Coons came from a documentary I saw in, I think it must have been 2007 or 2008. And I believe it was an older documentary, actually, from the 90s where he was being interviewed and there were some interesting um, comments that he made about his work. One of them being, he felt his work was incredibly generous. And what he meant by that at the time, I think is what we would say now to mean populist. Um, so he meant, so like he's, he's taking these childlike objects uh, quite literally, like I don't think I'm guessing he didn't fabricate these vinyl things himself. I, these blow ups himself. I'm pretty sure he probably found them or maybe, maybe he had them made. I don't know. Um, right. He's notorious for not having put his hands on any of his artwork. So exactly. And that the was idea the is that in a, and part of the controversy around him is that he doesn't really take part in the actual creation of the uh, objects. Most of the time it's, it's, it's a team of, uh, you know, people working in the studio. Right. Well, and that's what I've always, uh, so in that documentary, he talks about how he's never touched the work and like physically, like he's never actually touched any of these finished pieces that are coming from his studio, which is both um, bizarre to me. And actually one of the elements that I kind of like the most um, about that, like there's something so bizarre in this, uh, the artist's hand, so to speak, is the ability to mobilize a force of not incredibly well-paid studio assistants. A lot of them New York artists in their own right. A lot of them uh, young and up and coming or, or struggling. And, uh, and he uses all their skills and talents to harness what he likes. And he's, he's, it's honestly like he's an art director of an artist. And that term art director usually being used in the design context of like someone who has, you know, it, it reminds me a bit of the old Renaissance studios of like Michelangelo, who has this army of workers who are being trained by him. And then of course you see like their students become, you know, his star students would become famous afterwards as well. Except it doesn't seem like we have very much of this like, a studio assistant of Coons becomes famous and is well known for being studied under Coons. Like, I don't think anyone is studying under Coons. They're just being used. Yeah. I mean, the idea that, that he's creating these large uh, sculptures, usually made of metal. I, I would be surprised if he even knew how the process worked, you know, like I think he hires people that can make the things that he has no idea how to make. You know, he has may have the idea, oh, let's, and even the things that he recreates are not original things. They're not something that comes from his mind. Typically, they're things that he's just copying from in the real world, like right. like this, this inflatable bunny rabbit or the flower or the large, you know, blow up dogs and uh, other, you know, balloon animals and things like that. It's, it's not like he had some insight 
into the work or the creativity that came in behind it. He just kind of copied things and then did something unique to them by enlarging them to be like 20 feet tall or whatever. Right. So, well, and that's where I think, I think, especially looking at this from like 1979, it's like his uh, uh, proximity to folks like some of the early performance artists, the happenings in 60s, 70s and 80s and, um, and, and like Warhol um, in particular, I do think that, I mean, because Coons is considered one of the YBA, right? The Young British Artists. I'm not sure. I don't remember if he is or not. I know, I know Hearst is, Damien Hearst. So, but I, I haven't confirmed that. Yeah, I'd have to look that up again. Um, but there's something about like at that time, it was far more, uh, I think this idea of the artist running a factory, like what Warhol called his studio, and this idea of the artist being um, almost like the CEO of an enterprise that is creating things. Um, I think there's a lot of valid ideas there that are interesting and that can make it so that the work is far more conceptually relevant than it is aesthetically relevant. Like to me, this piece that we've looked at for a little bit now, like I do not personally receive very much satisfaction or visual interest. I don't really want to explore it even the idea that there's mirrors behind these objects so that if I were seeing it in person, I could look and see the backsides very easily. Like I would check, I would see if is there some hidden detail, but I, I doubt it, you know, seeing, you know, having seen several of Kunz's work, I think he literally just kind of wants you to have this uh, commodification kind of like, this is like a display stand. Like you might see a really nice pearl necklace or something. And instead it's these weird inflatable animal things. And they're, they've got these strange mirrors that are allowing you to see like kind of the underside of them on the back. Like it's, it, it, um, it's hard for me to not go to sexual realms with a lot of his work because he's so sensual and plastic and fake. And uh, I imagine a lot of his work inspired the likes of like Radiohead and their song, Fake Plastic Trees. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the idea that this work is, you know, he, he really pushes the idea of like even plastic, the materials, you know, plastic, even in later work, it's this idea that it's, you know, manufactured and things like that. The thing for me is that they're just so empty, you know, like all the work is just so empty. I mean, if you could, if you could say anything about his, his art, you know, perspective is like, I want to make the most, you know, empty artwork possible. Like if that could be a genre of work, you know, that's kind of what he, he's trying to do. He's, and he's pushing that idea. And he kind of, even on a personal level, you know, he's, he's, uh, the things that he uh, connects with just seem so superficial and so right. shallow and but they're like made up into these like this like this work right here it's like it's very colorful still but it, and it's like if from a distance you might you know come up to it and think oh well, what's this artwork about and then you realize oh it's just a, a couple of inflatables on some pieces of mirror and like you said the mirror is there maybe try to get you to think a little more deeply about it but it's still it's still not there's still nothing there there's still nothing to it so Right. I mean, he seems, his artwork a lot of the time seems very kind of depressing, you know, because it's like, it's almost pointless. And I well, think that's part of his game is this idea of like, you know, um, just like the silliness or, you know, there's a term I'm trying to think of, but they use in literature a lot, but just like the emptiness of things. Right, right. That, that sort of vapid quality that I think is where, um, in the documentary that I watched where he talks about his work being generous, I think that he talks about it sort of like how um, someone who's really sold on nihilism of like nothing is true or nothing has any meaning. Therefore you can put your own meaning onto things. You have complete agency to give meaning to whatever you want. Um, and the sort of uh, total freedom that that gives, I think at least from the, that documentary's perspective. I don't know if he's changed his perspective since then. I'm, I mean, that was like two decades ago, so I'm sure he has, um, although maybe not. <laughs> um, that sense of like 
he's creating, uh, especially amongst his, his uh, the, I'm going to call it his more um, family friendly sculptures, images that are not in any way offensive. They're highly relatable by a huge amount of the world, not just like Western culture or European culture or American culture. There's just so much there. And it's as if he wants us to realize that almost everything, right? Every single work of art is some, some level like a sacred object. You know, if it's the statue of David in Florence, we're like taking this holy thing and we're putting it up on a pedestal and we're saying it is remarkable and worth our time. And I think to some extent, he's basically like marveling at what we have made around us. We, like vinyl is a marvel in and of itself. And then when he puts it like this, you know, putting it in that, that same realm as something like a, uh, an ancient marble statue. Uh, I, I think there's like, it, but I can comprehend that marvel so quickly. It's like, yeah, I get it. I don't have to see it a million times in all these different arrangements. Um, so I think the closest thing I can come to, to giving like a positive view on particularly this piece is it makes me start to think that he, um, he understands the irony and the uh, vapidness of his work. And he embraces that to try yeah. to help the viewer like I, like I kind of think that he would find people buying his work a little bit foolish and, and a little bit funny. Yeah, well, I was just thinking that the idea of the absurd, you know, like the absurd, you find the humor in it, but you know that it doesn't have a lot to it at the same time. Like the, in literature also, like the idea that the absurd is like, you don't really believe anything when it comes to the absurd. You just think, you know, oh, look at that person they're so silly you know like and you, and you but you apply that to everything you know it's this like you said it's like this nihilist attitude but on top of it there's some humor involved so it becomes this like absurd thing that you can look at and kind of mock to some degree and that happens to you know all religions you know all religions gets get mocked by someone as being absurd and, you know, politics, you know, you can lay it across the, across everything, you know, so to me, that's what his, his work is about, is about, it's so absurd, like, this is, so, like, this is so absurd, what we're looking at, two inflatable toys on mirrors, that is just ridiculous, and that's the, that's his artwork, <laughs> yeah. you know, exposing that, and that's the part that I, the trouble that I always have with Coons is, like, I don't, that, that's not the world I come from. I don't come from a philosophy of, of absurdity, you know? Yeah. Like, and it's, and it's hard and it's challenging when you come across stuff like this, you know, cause I, you know, as a Christian, I'm, you know, I, I have things that I believe in. I have faith. I don't think Jeff Koons has, maybe has a lot of faith, although I think he was Catholic at one point. I don't know if he considered himself still Catholic, hmm. but this idea that, you know, Nothing matters, you know, nothing, everything's a joke, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's good. I mean, if, as long as you have your, I think you're fairly strong in your faith and you come across an artist like Coons and he challenges you and makes you think about how absurd life is or how absurd things are and about how you, it's just, some things are just so, you're just so unable to comprehend, you know, and that's part of being a person of faith is this, is, is the idea that you are kind of making that leap of faith on things. And it's just, it just helps to me, it helps you become stronger in your faith. As long as you're coming from it, from a perspective where you're not, you're not in a position to be challenged in a way that's going to kind of take that away from you. You know what I mean? Like you have yeah. to be ready and willing to interact with his work in a way where you're not going to become susceptible to maybe the things that he's become susceptible to, which is life is an absurdity, you know? Yeah. So part of me wonders, um, 
And I've never heard Kuhn speak to this himself, but I wonder how much of this could be read as a bit of like institutional critique, because the one thing that I've always thought about his work that is funny and um, to me pokes fun. And, and again, I would go, I think that there's a valid interpretation that the work is about like that absurd nihilistic point of view in the sense of everything. But I kind of wonder how much is he trying to be like a Duchamp where he's reacting to the art world as a whole as something along the lines of like um, most of the volume of this work is empty air. And he uses some of the most fake artificial colors. He plays off of things like balloon animals. And it's just, it's so empty, like quite literally empty, just air. Do you think that there's something for him to say along the lines of like, actually, this is a critique on all other artwork, that all other artwork is just the same? Well, I think, you know, if you consider like the young um, British artists, you know, and I'm not sure that he's one of them, but it's around the same time period. So the things that they're creating are have a lot of texture to them that, you know, they deal with a lot of, you know, more earth related things and maybe this like you said this is his response to that that that's all great and that's all great to reflect on and have these deep thoughtful you know uh, feelings about and bring a lot of meaning out of but yet there's also this other part of art making that is just silly and fun and and humorous and you don't have to be serious all the time you know so and I think that's he's kind of like the balance for what a lot of the other artists were doing where it was, you know, like you think of a Chris Burden or a, um, uh, what's his name? Damien Hurst, you know, mm -hmm. very deep artwork, you know, they, they, at least they tried to make this kind of artwork and they, they, they tried to create like a lot of, you know, deeper meaning in the things that they were creating. This, it, this is very superficial, you know, this is very on the surface. And so there's this, you know, it's, it's just another way of communicating and trying to interpret things that they're both trying to say, but they're trying to get to different, you know, endpoints, I think. Yeah, I just Googled the YBAs just, just for us to fact checking ourselves here. According to Wikipedia, he is not one of the YBAs. In fact, he was born in New York, which makes sense why he's not a yeah. know, British artist then. So, yeah, he's, you know, but he was, he's around during all that time, all the, the, the whole time that YBAs are, you know, becoming a success. Right. Um, do you mind going to some other images? I'm tired of looking at this one. <laughs> yeah. So let's go to. Cause these, this is interesting. I've never seen like this one, uh, a much smaller, a much more reserved and such an old piece. But even just like, you couldn't tell me if I didn't see the dates on the bottom of these ones, like the, the difference was 22, 23 years and he's still, uh, but ne the only, like this one, 2011, 2015 edition of three looks so similar to that last piece, which was 1979. I think the major difference is, is we no longer have vinyl. We have actual metal for this. And it looks kind of like an inflatable, like a like a toy, but at the same time, it has that reflective quality. So it looks a little more like a balloon or something, which is still an inflatable. But there are handles on this, which makes you think that some kid would sit on it and kind of bounce around. But yeah, it's it's the same thing. It's like you know, it's you know, going from something that he found to something that he is going to the lengths to manufacture in metal. You know. Like it's the process, like he's, he is putting so much time and energy into making this, you know, this cheap, you know, superficial, you know, object that it's, it's just, it just, it's just a further critique on culture today. You know, like what, at what ends will we go to, to make something that is completely superficial, you know, humorous, uh, vapid, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's. Yeah. It's a great critique and that, but that's what, but Coons is such a deplorable, you know, not to use the word, you know, in any political way, but he, nobody likes Coons, you know, personally, you know, they probably like him because he's charismatic or, you know, he's great to talk to, you know, but like his life is like 
just it's not something that as from a christian perspective you'd be like that guy, that's, a, that's a great guy you know like you know it's just it's just hard to imagine that um there are many people that can approach his work knowing about his personal life you know him him personally as an artist and can appreciate it on the same level that's why I, i've told you that i have kind of this love hate relationship with his artwork mostly because i know about you know more of his personal life too and it's just you know i appreciate the art for what it is and what it's trying to like communicate but it still kind of gives you that skin crawling kind of feeling you know <laughs> well yeah and that's what like when you think about the fact that he's had 30 or 40 years more than that 79 to yeah so 40 years of success these things like one of these is like really close to the new world trade center down in new york he's got one of his red uh inflatable dog um balloon animals and um you know they're all over the world it just i see I don't like to just think about artists and their work in, in the context of the artists themselves. Cause um, especially coming from a Christian perspective, we all know none of us are perfect. And I think about some of like some of the greats, you know, or, or even, even Caravaggio, I love Caravaggio. And yet he was a murderer. He died as, as an exile on, on the run from the law. That doesn't mean I can't appreciate his artwork even though I, I should still consider some of those personal elements in regards, geez, geez. And that's, this is what gets me is like, if he is a cultural critique artist, if he's critiquing the culture and the institutions of the art world, why is it so successful? Why, like, why is Jay-Z embracing the inflatable dog? Is it, are all of these people being duped? Um, or is this actual, like, is Coons genuinely believing that when you lose something like the religion and all of the meaning that is developed by some sort of religious perspective in a culture, that you can take ubiquitous icons, almost like, like our emojis, you can take an emoji, make it meaningful to the extent that Kanye can perform between its legs, the legs of a balloon animal dog. And that's suddenly powerful. Yeah, I mean, I think you're onto something with that is the idea that this is, you know, the the idol you know like this is the something this is something people begin to worship because they have nothing else to go to and unfortunately it's so shallow that they live in a culture that you know doesn't they don't you know care for other people you know it's it's just it's really interesting the way you know and, and i don't know if jeff coons you know from the beginning thought like oh this is this is you know how my art should be looked at or interpreted he could be the most shallow person on the planet, as far as I know. But the way you can read into his work and you see, you know, like you said, you know, Kanye is performing in front of this inflatable balloon that for me is interpreted as very shallow and, you know, uh, humorous and absurd. And it's just, that's just how life is now, you know, it's, I don't know if he, I don't know, if he, he's a pretty smart dude from what I understand, but it's, or at least a deep thinker. I don't know how smart of a thinker he is, but just to, you know, just that idea that, you know, he's, he's considering like the, the plasticness of our life and how easily, and I don't know if it's, he's trying to dupe people. I don't think he's that conniving. I, th I think he is genuinely trying to put this stuff on display to show how just, you know, empty we are, you know? See, I, that's where that, I, 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 I genuinely believe that that was part of his thought process. Which, which makes me respect it more, like, because it's a little bit like the, 
it's like taking advantage of the emperor with no clothes. You're being the clothes salesman. He's the clothes salesman. And then like, you know, the audience is either we're going to be like, we're going to buy the lie or we're going to point and laugh at the lie, which then, so then I wonder, so how is it, if that is his position, if he is the salesman of the emperor's invisible clothes, how can he have 40 years of success making so much money? Is it purely because he sells spectacle, massive, ubiquitous, unchallenging, giant red sculptures that basically no one else has the ability to make because they don't have the money behind them to, and they don't have the minions behind them to make something so massive? Yeah, I mean, it could it could be as simple as that. I mean, once you find kind of your niche, you can kind of probably exploit it pretty, you know, as, as far as he has. I mean, he's expo been exploiting it for decades. Um, let me try to find some more examples here. Let's see. I thought there was one. So this is, I can't find the dog, but this is an example of, um, these yeah. large scale. I like that swan this is mirror lot, polished actually. stainless steel with transparent color coating. It is uh, nearly 12 feet tall. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a balloon animal. Yeah, but the thing that's crazy to me is like the, the sheer physical experience of something like this is... Um, at the moment, not every day. As in, you can't just walk, like I can't just walk down the street and find a look at. Now, once I've looked at it for, for me being someone, like I can look at things for a while. Once I look at this for about five to 10 minutes, I'm probably done. Like I'm done. I don't, I don't need to come back to it. It's not memorable. It doesn't challenge me. It doesn't push me to some new level. Uh, there are some interesting sort of like formal aspects that I think about, but it really doesn't go beyond that for me. It doesn't, it doesn't become meaningful. And I probably won't, the things I will remember about it are how interesting reflections refracted <laughs> in such tight bends are interesting. Yeah. Well, you, Not, you've got you. Yeah. I was just thinking about the, almost the same thing. And then I started to remember the gazing balls. Yeah. And I thought, look what he's doing with these gazing balls. Like he's, there's this majestic scene, this painted scene. And I'm, you know, I'm sure this is probably reproduced by one of the studio people. And then there's this shiny ball stuck right in the middle of it. So yeah. it's almost like he's, he's telling you what he's doing you know, which annoys the crap out of me, <laughs> you know, like he's like, he's saying, look, look what you have to look at this, this incredible landscape. Uh, someone took tirelessly painted and, but I know when I stick this nice blue reflective sphere in there, that's the only thing you're going to care about. Yeah. You're you know, right. It's like this completely like, don't look at something amazing. Look at yourself in this reflective ball. You know, it's, it's he's he and he's I think he's he's and whether it's the years have went by and he's you know people have interpreted his work in different ways and analyzed it and he's like finally like okay this is this is the culmination this is what you're all telling yeah. me is that something is from my own work even if he isn't smart enough to figure it out on his own is that I can give you this grandiose scene. And if I stick something reflective in it, people are going to go right to the reflective ball. You know, that's how absurd and superficial they are. Yeah, I think you're right. It's weird. It's weird thinking about the reflective balls. I think I've seen one of them in person. I'm trying to remember where. But, you know, Anish Kapoor does a lot of these um, lacquered concave wood pieces that are mirrored because they're finished so well that they are these strange optical where like the way in which they are reflective, I don't know how it works mathematically, but as you approach it, there's like this area uh, where suddenly your reflection flips upside down. Mm -hmm. And when you watch it happen, it's like you can feel your brain all of a sudden 
Cause you're like, I was watching an image. I was watching myself get bigger in this image. I know how mirrors work. And then suddenly it flips and it's just like, Oh, it's like, you're like, stop that brain. You know, like it's this weird visual phenomena that it's like, suddenly you can feel yourself perceiving the world. Whereas this is like, it just is so much like you're a fish. You're looking at shiny things or like you're a little monkey. You're trying to see yourself and your friends. And that is his message. Like, I really think I'm being more and more convinced of this, that he thinks very, very little of human beings and that all of these grandiose, like almost all of this is either religious, mythical, or these insane, uh, dramatic landscape um mythic scenes and he's like no matter what if you're looking at the madonna and child with four saints the thing you're really interested in is where am i yeah that's a good point and not only where are you but just the and because it's a distortion you know like i'm that's what i'm i've never understood the orb and maybe the orb is something I have missed in the rest of his work, like coming through the rest of his work. Hmm. I mean, I, you see it in the, 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 the swans and the rabbits and the dogs and things like that. You've already seen that kind of metallic finish. And it's just, so the orb for me, you know, it, it has this like metaphysical kind of like religious thing on its own. Like it's some, it's some force within yeah. the work already. And you're kind of a pro it's almost like an eye like you're being looked at almost by the orb too you know like this is and you're distorted and you're disfigured and and maybe that's part of what he's trying to say also i mean i this is what i love about interpreting artwork is like you can lay on a bunch of stuff that maybe even the artist didn't even wasn't even considering or it's or it's kind of locked inside yourself and you're kind of projecting it out onto the work but just the idea that, you know, this could even be like an eye or some kind of lens that's looking back at you and it's saying like you're it's telling you you're missing something like you're missing out on something and you got to look look around more. You know, don't just look at the eye or the orb or whatever, like get over yourself and like really and in, in get like connect with the things that are around you, you know, so. That's pro that could be reading way too much into it, but like I said, that this art is the place where you can do that, where you can really kind of let your thoughts kind of go in, in many different directions. Well, it still to me is, I, I still wonder then, like there's lots of ways in which we can um, comment on the limitations of human beings and how bad we are at perceiving like like so the prime example of another thing that does is like sleight of hand artists their whole entire trickery and the the wonder of watching a good magician is the fact that they're highlighting how blind you are to reality so here we have an artist who if if we continue our our kinds of uh, discussion here if we were to put forward something like jeff coons's work is trying to highlight how vapid and empty we all are and how when we're looking at artworks, we're just trying to see ourselves in the things. We don't actually look at the thing. We try to see us. Basically, he's like, we're all narcissists staring at our own reflection all the time. And really, you can see that in like magazines and especially like reality TV culture and Instagram. And there's some level where that's definitely true. Why do the very, very wealthy and do these institutions, museums, and all, all of that, like, why are they spending four decades investing in this artist? Like, like, is there something else happening that is, is the reason why his work is so celebrated? Or is it just because, like, I, if I remember correctly, he was rather well off early on. And so he was able to make some pretty big bombastic sculptures before like someone like myself, especially in the earlier days of my career, I had really, really strict budgets that it just, I couldn't, I couldn't even use metal. I couldn't use metal. I couldn't afford it. You know, do you think it's just that he had the means to, 
to make big work. And so it attracted audiences and then a bunch of people got tricked by the magician magician. Well, I think that people definitely, I don't know if they even got tricked by the musician. I think they were so entertained by Coons that they kind of just went along for the ride. And, you know, I think, you know, Coons, Coons is, if anything, a, a, a sensational businessman, you know, he had, he had a reputation for decades for being, you know, the great salesman, you know, like, like the great business mind and things like that. I don't know if that's true or not. I, maybe he just got lucky, you know, a lot of successful people get lucky in one thing and then make a fortune from it. Um, but it's, you know, that's, I think that's part of it. You know, this idea of conceptual art too, I think that fed into it a lot as well. You know, that this is, this artwork is working on a much higher level than a lot of other straight, more straightforward work, traditional work. And so, you know, and I think it's, I think as far as like you're talking about the magician part of it, I think that's part of it also is this idea that, you know, he could come in and say, well, this is, you know, this is really conceptual and it deals with, you know, deconstruction and blah, blah, you know, whatever art theory he wants to stick onto it. And so I think he had, he was in a, like a perfect storm, you know, where he could, sell a lot of this stuff, have other people manufacture it. That became part of the concept. And it just, he was just, you know, in the right place, the right time. You know, Andy Warhol was, I think, to some degree, was in the right place at the right time as well, you know. And he kind of, Warhol, you know, I think is a nice transition into Coons and the, you know, it just keeps, there has to be somebody working in this absurd, you know, theme of artwork and I think not that I think um Warhol was completely absurd but he he commercialized the art world you know so it's like that in itself is kind of you know repulsive and superficial so it's like that just kind of and, and Coons was like I see I see what Warhol did and I can see what I do considering the landscape and he just you know took the opportunity Coons is everything negative you want to say about Coons has been applied to Coons. He's an opportunist, you know, his work, is, he doesn't touch his artwork. He doesn't, he's not a real artist. And all these things have been applied to him. And I, I have a, I have a sense that maybe some of that same stuff was said about Warhol, you know, when he was starting to put his, his work together. So it's always this kind of like back and forth between, you know, commercial commercialization of art and the the true artist that gets his hands dirty and labors in the studio for months and on end to produce this great one piece of work whereas you have who's like oh i found this lobster you know inflatables go reproduce it for me and we're going to sell you know hundreds of them <laughs> it's disgusting right. yeah there's something about like warhol I'm, I don't know if anyone has a really, really great grasp on Warhol even still, but um, my opinion of him, I think very, very highly of him. I think like what he did was intriguing. And I think that there's some level where he pointed out a lot of the inherent consumerisms that had sort of pervasively changed American culture. Um, and I think we think of this really like normal today, but at the time it wasn't that like, we think of like throwaway culture and how, or fast fashion, all of it, like every element of our life is sort of ubiquitously controlled by these, um, this consumerism. Um, you know, like I was reading a book, I think it was, it was either Annie Dillard or Manlon Lingle back in the seventies and eighties. And they were, the, the author was talking about how, how, how was the public okay with being just called consumers? Like, how were we fine with that? It's very bizarre, but I think Warhol was sort of approaching that with shining a light on it and trying to be, trying to present it in a pretty neutral fashion in order that we might see the absurdity. You know, when we see Marilyn Monroe's image getting washed out and becoming flat and becoming um, something that is no longer the glitz and glamour of the original photograph, let alone of the woman herself. I think there's something sober about it 
Whereas when I look at this work, it feels like um, it feels like a jester, a court jester laughing at the absurdity of the, the stupid tyrant or something like that. Like he's taking advantage of all the same things that Warhol was, but rather than sort of, I think, mourning it melancholically like Warhol was, I think Coons is gleeful. I think, I yeah. think he's probably having a, in his eyes, I, I would imagine he's having a great life. He's yeah. incredibly wealthy, probably lives in, I mean, I know that he's got some sort of studio space in New York. I'm sure he's got other locations around the world and he probably can just enjoy himself. Yeah, I, w- I would say Coons is probably compared to Warhol, much more decadent in the way that he presents his work. It's, it's much more disturbing and it's it's still a critique, but maybe it's the critique the critique that needs to me to, to to move past this idea. You know, like you said, being being called a consumer. Nobody, I don't know that anybody would like that. They don't, you know, there's a lot of people that would like to think that they have some refined taste and that they appreciate, you know, craft and things like that. But the fact is that's that's those people are hard to find, you know. And this idea that he's taking what Warhol was saying about commercialism and consumerism and then pushing it one step further to say, you people have become decadent, you know, he's critiquing what's the next stage of consumerism, which is like you said, like throwaway culture. And, you know, the, the idea that you don't have ever have any real experiences or real connections with anything because you're too busy thinking about yourself. You know, it's about, it's a selfish, it's the selfish, I think, insight that that, that's, you know, that I don't, I don't think being selfish is a good thing. I think that's completely good and disgusting, but you know, it's, that's, that's his critique and people, like you said, it's the, the magician or the emperor with no clothes. It's like people, you know, and maybe Coons isn't the best person to bring be bringing that message to people that you have because he's decadent himself. And I don't know what message that sends to people also. I mean, you could say that he's, you know, the epitome of evil. And I'm sure someone has probably written that about him, you know, but he's he's the messenger, you know, he's he's telling you that, you know, that you're creating a uh, a space for your life that's not that's empty you know and I think we need artists like that to tell us that you know you could go down a path you really don't want to go down you know maybe it's you, um you could go down a path that's fake plastic you know and that's that has no meaning no real meaning except for this idea that your life is an absurdity and so I think you need people like that. And maybe I feel, you know, maybe Coons is, you know, I don't know what his personal life is like. I don't know how dedicated he is to his faith, if he has any. But you need people like that, too, to say, listen, this this is the direction you could really, you know, destroy your life over and you make perhaps even your soul. So maybe bring it back around and maybe appreciate other, you know, other things in your life be, besides decadence and the superficial. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a really good way to encounter some of his work. I'm just thinking about the, uh, stay on this image, but I was, I'm just thinking about the balloon animals of before, like the swan we were looking at. Um, maybe a good way to encounter Coons is to think of it like this. Um, why not put a balloon animal animal on a pedestal as compared to say a statue of David. If, if they really are not in any sense different in significance, when one of them, you can quite literally see your shiny reflection in a really fun, interesting way. And the other one is just another sculpture in that sense it's just another person this ancient story you can just ignore that like why look and 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 then if you take it into this series as a viewer you have to decide like are you going to look at manet's painting of a spanish singer 
Or are you going to look at yourself in that fun, interesting, hilarious little ball? And I think that it's that question of like the viewer then, either you buy into that element of like, none of this matters. And I might as well just look at myself because that's far more entertaining and fun. It's going to be a way better selfie. Or you can, you can push against that and say, you know, some of those, some of those um, easily entertained qualities that I have, I should push against them. And, and I think that maybe that's why it's always, you know, who, who was it? It was like a Picasso or something who said, if no one loves your work, then no one hate, or if no one hates your work, then no one loves it. Maybe the reason Coons is successful is because he is polarizing and you are forced to ask that question of yourself of like, either I have to agree and I have to admit that there is no technical difference in significance between a balloon dog and a statue of David, or I have to say, this artist is challenging me to overcome some of my basic instincts to just look at my reflection. Yeah, I think, I think that also is the idea that something so easily created could occupy your time. And you don't think of the, like we don't, it goes to the idea of, the, of superficial, like we don't consider the labor, you know, put into some of this artwork. And, and at the same time, there's this idea of, I don't, I shouldn't have to consider the labor. I live in 2021. It's easy to make this stuff. It's, you know, I don't have to be concerned about the, the, mental and physical anguish that went into creating an artwork when I can just hit print on my computer and pull scribbly lines and it's out and I can put it on my wall. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing that I think feeds into his work also is the, you know, the, like you said, the consumerism, manufacturing, you know, and on demand, things that are on demand now. You know, even like the 3D printers now, you know, you can print your own cup, you know, and, and stuff like that. It's just so easy to make things, you know, it's, and I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's the, you know, culturally, it's this idea that, you know, think what it was like a hundred years ago or 150 years ago and how, or even 300 years ago and how difficult it was to make a painting or make sculpture or, you know, and I don't mm. think people, it's the culture we're in. We're so superficial, you know, and we, we just don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm liking it. I'm liking this work a lot more now. Yeah. Especially the reflective stuff. I'm intrigued by some of the other images you had up there. I don't know if we have time to talk about it today, but the, uh, uh well that one. one that one is super so do you know well this one's a painting oil inks on canvas well, this go was, back to the other one that's the actual yeah. thing so this is stainless steel wood soil fabric internal and living flower plant plants wow see that's just like like quite literally spectacular in the sense yeah. of the <laughs> like this is actually impressive and fun you know like he created a, a garden on a sculpture. Yeah, basically. But this, <laughs> this is where like, this is where he just punches you in the face with his like big old middle finger or something. Cause it's like, you have the technical capabilities of making a, all, I, I don't know if it's just the photo, but it's almost three stories tall, three story tall floral arrangement of, and, and you can get the folds of, I think it's a terrier, a terrier's face or something like that. I'm not an expert on dog breeds, <laughs> but you can like, look at what he can do. And then the thing you present is a dog. Like, right. <laughs> and it's, and it's like one of those inbred dogs that is like, not, um, you know, it's not like, it's not like a working dog. It's not like a powerful dog where it's like become a, a, a symbol of, 
you know, like like nations, we always choose these symbols of regal animals, the predators, right. or like, like a mastiff you know, or something like that. Right. <laughs> it's not. It's it's a little like, it's like the kind of dog that Paris Hilton would put in her purse. <laughs> right. And it's back in 1992. Like yeah, 30 years ago. Gosh, it's so like I'm both amazed, wish I could see it, and insulted all at once. And just like <laughs> seriously, you had you had the capability to make like he could have made a statue of David life size out of flowers, and that in and of itself would be a very interesting thing to see. Instead, he's like very, very small dog. Yeah, massive. Right. <laughs> And, and, and I think when he says like, this goes back to like, this is the same era that the, the documentary I saw where he's like using that word um, generous. He's like, my work is generous. And it's like, I think he literally means it's um, everyone it's gets it. Before. Yeah. Like everyone, everyone's like, oh my gosh, a dog. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, everybody gets it. <laughs> and it's just like, that that is i don't know if i would call that generous like that's like a knock knock joke is generous everyone gets a knock knock joke yeah well that's that part of his decadence you know i'm so right. generous i'm such a great person i'm going to give bestow this onto you you know right oh god it's so <laughs> But at the end of the day i'm like well what makes any artist different you know i constantly talk to my students about how like no matter what you do as an artist, you have to have some level of arrogance because at the end of the day, you have to say, I slaved away, or even, even the fact that I used that language. I worked in my studio and you should take a look at what I did. It's like, well, that. why? Why should people do that in and of itself? What is, uh, what is, any, what is the work of your hands? How, how does it have any level of merit? And then you have him going out like this and just like, it's just, it's just crazy. It really is kind of um, like a, as, as a artist myself, I'm, I'm just impressed at the level of absurdity that he's able to get away with to where I, it's like, you can't help but stand back and be, yeah, impressed. I don't know. Well, it's like you said too. I mean, he, Coons, Coons from the beginning, was a success. I mean, he kind of hit the, hit the ground running. So he, it seems like, and I don't, I don't know about, you know, here's the picture of his early work. You know, this is just, you know, if I saw this, I, you know, today I'd be like, this is garbage, you know, like this is ridiculous, but you know, he was, he was, like you said, he was trying to make a comment. It was a certain time. It was certain, you know, you know, people need to put things in context, which I know nobody likes to do anymore. But, you know, this this work, you know, at the time was probably challenging on some level. And you can see how this how his work progressed from this also. But I think, you know, like I said, Coons is an opportunist. He's a businessman. He knew what was going to sell and he knew how to sell it. You know, so he, he was, I think, from the beginning, hit, hit the ground running. And so he had that he quickly created the resources for himself to up his game. You know, he kept he kept raising the bar as far as like, you know, the amount of, you know, resources that he needed to create the work that he was making. You know, this anybody could have bought this stuff that he did in the early work. But it, you know, making a three story flower dog I and mean, that was going to take some significant funding. So, and he, but he, he pushed himself there, but uh, I don't know where I was going with that exactly, but just the idea that, you know, being an artist is a process, being an artist is a lifelong pursuit, you know, and if you think you're going to get success in your late twenties or early thirties, you're probably fooling yourself. Like you have to, when you're an artist that's going to have some some long term success, you you have to be lifelong artist. You know, picking it up when you're in your late 60s, uh, having huge success in your early to mid, you know, late 20s, super rare, super rare. <laughs> you know, but yeah. if you are committed to your work and you show people that you're committed to your work, your that stuff pays off. It always pays off. Go look at Sotheby's. Go look at auction houses. 
go look at the number of artists that you have not even heard of that are selling work for thousands of dollars. You know, like you've got to, you, you got to keep yourself motivated. And that's one way I think that you can really keep yourself motivated is that you've got to see the people, their names, you know, on videos or podcasts or in books. Those, those are highlights of the greater art world. And you've got to really kind of just keep things in perspective. You know, it, the thing that frustrates, frustrates me the most as a museum person is I see museums purchase artwork by someone in their late to late 20s, early 30s. And that this is from like 20 years ago and they stopped making artwork after that and they were done. And they don't have a body of work to like share with everybody. They, you know, I don't know, who knows what it was. Maybe they had a career change or whatever. But that's the disappointing thing for me about a lot of contemporary artwork and purchasing contemporary artwork is that you ha you don't know the, the lasting power of the work, and you gotta have to you have to see this this work over someone's lifespan. Of course, you gotta make money as an artist, so that's the catch. You know, you gotta figure out how to make money while sustaining your career, your lifelong career as an artist. But you know. You got to keep things in perspective. Well, not flash in the pan overnight artists are super rare, <laughs> right? Well, and even some of the ones that it happens to, like it, um, there are there are there are lots of stories of folks who get like celebrated very very fast. You know, get in Gagosian when they're in their twenties or something like that, and um, they they struggle after that first successful body of work of coming up with the next idea. And I think part of that is just that they haven't had much practice doing it like as in literally they don't have as much time you know i think about like the the other thing that uh, the other thing i don't know how to deal with personally in my own practice is that sense of like you know anselm Kiefer or damian hurst or or here especially with jeff, jeff coons that sense of like making the same thing with like the slightest variation like a hundred times and on one sense you're like well you're making it so that audience but it seems like each time you do the same piece over and over, it cheapens each individual piece, like a possible, like an inflation, really. Um, I'm thinking about the inflated animals now, just that word, the, the, the double meaning of that word. Um, and how it, it's, it's like the artistic process and the, the constant creation and the way in which most of us have to dedicate so dedicate our spare time to creative endeavors because we need a different job to um, sustain us until maybe we get lucky one day and, uh, and we, we strike it big commercially, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. I can't imagine. See, I think of it more along the lines of like, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't work for a museum, but I have um, had some relative success and the thing I like is for people to buy for their own personal collections to buy contemporary artists, not as investments, but as things you want to live with. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a very different approach than a museum. Like obviously a museum shouldn't purchase that way. People aren't living in museums yet. Uh, <laughs> well, they drink that, their coffee in museums. So. <laughs> right, right. That'll be, that'll be my performance piece is make a museum, let me live there forever. Um, <laughs> but uh, that sense of like, there's, there is some risk or, or, or there's some, some sort of realization you have to have when you purchase a contemporary work of art that it might not be, it might not be this person's end all be all. They, they might not continue it forever. So. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I've purchased some artwork recently and I think the same thing. I think, is this person going to stick with it? Are they going to, you know, are they going to, and like you said, I, I, I bought the work because I wanted to be support, specifically supportive of this artist. And I thought this would be a good way to do it. You know, it, I typically would not spend the kind of money I did on this kind of artwork, but I thought, well, you know, he seems dedicated to his craft, you know, and I, I saw it first as a something that I enjoyed that I enjoyed the artwork and I enjoyed looking at it and then I thought well yeah I could probably have this in my house like you mentioned but then, honestly I did think like you know is this 
work going to appreciate over time? Is it going to be worth more, you know, 20 years from now? And I really thought about is, you know, can, you know, when I was looking at the work, I thought, are other people going to be as impacted by this work as I am? And then, you know, I had to research a little bit and think about, do they seem like they're serious? Like, are, do they believe that they're artists, you know, and that they're going to, they're going to be doing this for the rest of them, their lives. And it's a risk, you know, it's a risk you have to take when you're purchasing artwork is that, you know, something could happen to them uh, tomorrow and they may not even had a, had a chance to really get their hooks into the art world and then and then nothing happens with their work at all and they you know they may be a footnote somewhere um but like you know it's it's risky buying artworks risky you know like you said it's it should be something that you enjoy and that you get some personal fulfillment from yourself but it's you know it's a it's a tough game 